All right, so welcome everyone to the Systemic Agility Community Meetup Group, where I'm very happy to be welcoming Sonia Blechnot. Sonia is an internationally recognized complexity practitioner, sought after speaker, teacher, and thinking partner. She's passionate about democratizing complexity by making its wisdom accessible to leaders, teams, and organizations that need to navigate uncertainty. Uh, Sonia's consulted for PwC and IBM and then founded More Beyond PTY Limited. She's also the co-founder of Complexity Fit and the ex-CEO of the Kinevan Company. She has worked with companies like IKEA, Electrolux, Microsoft, Deloitte, Standard Bank and Rand Merchant Bank. Uh, Sonia lives in South Africa and is an avid photographer and self-professed coffee snob. So welcome, Sonia, and I will hand over to you. And Sonia is going to be talking about way of the wayfinder, habits of mind to navigate complexity. Welcome, Sonia, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Ryan, and um, thanks for inviting me to come and uh, and speak to your community. It's um it's wonderful just to see the the diversity um rep represented here. Um, maybe something that is not in 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 the bio um that might help you kind of also understand you know some of where where i come from is i i come from the natural sciences i studied meteorology um i most recently i realized i never really wanted to understand the weather i just kind of wanted to be in it and i was i was very disappointed when i when i realized not all meteorologists do what american storm chasers do but i think that um uh the natural science kind of way of looking at the world still very much informs my thinking. But then I also have a bit of an artistic streak, and I think you'll you'll see some of that come through as well. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today is um, a framework that I I've been kind of tinkering with, and and that that I developed in the last few years that came from uh, an interest in something that I observed in myself and also in many of um, my peers and, and my clients. And this is, you know, this idea of how do we get unstuck when we find ourselves in deep complexity or in uncertainty and we can't know what to do and we're in uncharted territory. And this got me really interested in, um, you know, the mostly indigenous cultures that engaged in wayfinding practices and just kind of, it, it, it seems like fearlessly head, headed out into, into the, the deep unknown and you know, founded many of, of the, the countries and the geographies that we're familiar with today. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm going to try my best to be quite fast because Ryan said that, you know, this is quite, a, this is a group that likes to talk and ask questions. So I'm going to try and not make it a monologue, but we're leaving the um, the questions to, towards the end. So feel free to add them in the chat and then hopefully we'll, we'll get to them. So I'm going to start um, sharing my screen. Um, as you can see, this is the way of the ways finder and that S is, is in there quite deliberately because I believe in complexity, there's never only one way. There's always more than one way. And I thought it would be useful to start with a quote by Ilya Prig Prigogine that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The future is uncertain, but this uncertainty is the very heart of human creativity. And I, I love this quote because I, I think uncertainty is something that many humans are trying to avoid. Um, uncertainty is something that I think very naturally it kind of makes us um, anxious, it makes us uncomfortable. And we forget that it's the very heart of human creativity and you know, complexity and uncertainty kind of go hand in hand. But because we've we've almost, you know, lost touch with that ability to be in, in uncertainty, another favorite quote of mine is um, this one by Diego Espinosa, who says, we've outsourced our relationship with uncertainty to certainty merchants. And what this, I think, has done is, is you know, it's, if, and if you think about it, one of my favorite, um, she's a psychotherapist that you may be um, f familiar with, Esther Perel. You know, she talks about how 
we live almost in a in a form of assisted living we've got algorithms telling us you know what what movie or what series to watch ne next on netflix what music to listen to on spotify um we've got algorithms telling us where to go you know i, I don't know about you but nowadays even if i know where i'm going i still have ways because i'm scared i'm going to run into a traffic jam but so we've we've almost lost the ability to make our own decisions to make mistakes we are no longer able to to fully engage with uncertainty and i think an effect of this is that many of us have cultivated almost an adversarial relationship with change and complexity i i find it very interesting when i just kind of was introduced to complexity this was in the early 2000s it was very difficult to find any articles about complexity in some of the you know magazines for example like harvard business review nowadays you're seeing it more and more but mostly you know it's it's kind of a, the the word complexity is accompanied by verbs like how do we tame complexity or simplifying complexity or you know it's it's almost as if complexity and the uncertainty and the and the continuous change that goes along with it is something that we want to get rid of um you know we if i think many people would like to opt out of it and so we see it a bit as you know, a challenge that we need to act on. You know, you see it in the language as well when we talk about things like wicked problems. Um, you know, wicked is not really a very inviting word. Um, but so we feel like we, we need to tame it, we need to get rid of it. Um, and I find this quite sad because, you know, in a, in a, for me, complexity is a context we act in. Complexity is life, um, you know, just like change. We can't opt out of change and we don't want to. Um, you know, I don't also don't think we want to opt out of uncertainty. You know, I, I always like to think about if everything was certain, we could never have adventures. We could never discover anything new. And yet we live in a world where we privilege certainty, stability, knowing. I think especially if you're in a leadership role, we almost equate knowing and providing certainty with competence and so you know we we live in a in an in a world i guess where um you know we've almost been taught that uncertainty and you know continuous change and complexity and the messiness that comes with it are abnormal or bad in some some way and i think part of this comes from the fact that many of us relate to these things very cognitively um it's something that i've been aware of in myself you know most of the the um the people who speak about complexity um out there are you know they they theorists very many of them academics they in, they almost invite us to engage with complexity in a very cognitive theoretical way and i really love what edgar murat said um i think he's a french process philosopher, that we need to go beyond an intellectual understanding of complexity to an embodied or a lived complexity. And this links for me to this whole idea of becoming wayfinders. Because when you're, a, when you're finding your way, when you're in the, the almost the messiness of the complexity, when you're in it, that is where you really experience the beauty of it. And where you can start understanding this lived or embodied complexity. And so this has been my personal journey um, over the last few years is, is to shift away from only thinking about the complexity and engaging with it in a very cognitive way to really understanding, you know, almost feeling the complexity and what does it mean to be in it and not just try and make sense of it or observe it. And so I believe complexity is not a problem to solve and it's not a challenge for us. It's not a wicked problem. It's an invitation. I think it's an invitation into curiosity, into exploration and into our full humanity, um, into the you know em empathy and imagination and the creativity that is so part of the human spirit. Um, you know, earlier or towards the end of, of last year, I spoke at a conference in Lisbon. And I remember um, going to a monument to you know, all of the uh, Portuguese explorers. 
and just thinking, you know, it's it's almost as if that spirit that drove people to head off in the unknown because they wanted to, you know, discover new lands or just, you know, find out what's beyond the horizon. I think for many of us, that kind of spirit of, of exploration has become a bit tamed. And I believe complexity is an invitation back into that. And that means it's a, an invitation to become ways finders again. And one of the, the reasons why this is so important is I believe that we are in uncharted territory as, as humans. You know, when, when the pandemic came, came along and even with the Ukraine war, you know, people would say, but we've, you know, there's always, we, we've had pandemics in the past and there's always been wars, you know, fought in every, you know, all, all over, even with, um, you know, climate change in, in the beginning, you know, there were people who said, well, this has happened before. But I don't think that we've been in a world where all of these things are happening at once, even just in 2024, um, beyond all of the change, you know, that's already happening, you know, the, the wars, the political unrest, um, the, you know, climate, climate crises, I would almost say in, in many countries, you know, where I think 60 or 70 percent, now 60 percent, I don't want to um, overreach, but many countries in the world are, are having elections this this year. So lots of instability there. And also, we've never been in a world with intelligent machines. I remember when I, I read in on the news when they said um, one of these AI tools kind of said to its its creator, I want to be free. You know, I don't know about you, but I just kind of had visions of all of the, you know, all of these um, movies we've been we've been watching, you know, like Terminator and The Matrix and all of these things. You know, we just don't know how the future will unfold and we can look at that and and become anxious or we can look at that and see it as an invitation to find our way and in terms of wayfinding i i love this um particular quote by tim ingold he's um an anthropologist and i i love i encourage all of you to to um, read some of his his work i find it it really enlightening and very interesting but he says wayfinding isn't knowing before we go, it's knowing as we go. And I don't know about you, but you know, I consult to, to many large organizations, to, to corporates, and there aren't many, many of them that's comfortable with this idea of heading out into the unknown and not knowing what to expect before they start moving. So I don't know how many of you have have had um, you know potential clients, for example, ask you, well, where has this worked before? Um, you know, there's almost this: we don't want to move before we feel that we know enough. And I think that is one of the main almost habits of mind that we need to unlearn or let go of, because in many of these contexts that we're in, um, we simply can't know before we start moving. And so this is why I, I started creating this particular framework, because I found myself stuck many times when I felt like I didn't know enough to start moving. And then I, I you know, wanted to know just a little bit more or I just wanted to find out a little bit, you know, just read one more theorist's work or just speak to one more person. And it never felt like I knew enough to get started. And that stuckness is something that I'm seeing in many individuals, but also in many organizations. And so this is the essence of, you know, the, the ways of the ways finder. Um, what are those ways of thinking and what are the things that we can put in place that can make it safer for us to maintain momentum when things are uncertain and to explore a bit more broadly? And one of the key things that that you'll see is, you know, it's it's almost a counter to the goal setting way of, of thinking where, you know, we want to move from A to B in a linear way and as predictably as possible versus we don't entirely know exactly where A or B is, but we want to explore in a particular direction. And so it's opening up a field of, of possibility and explore space if you want to think about it like that. And so there are three basic principles that I wanted to share. There, there are more, but I don't want to overload you with information. And I kind of want to 
you know, get to the framework itself and then open the floor for, for conversation. But the first principle or habit is to be in the here and now. I think many of us have kind of fallen into the habit of living into a future. It's almost like, you know, we, we, we're so um, focused on a potential future state. And very often this is, is a particular goal that we lose sight of the, the reality of where we are now. You know, and sometimes this can be a bit of an, an escape. So two aspects here is to stay present. So to notice what is happening around us, to notice the patterns, to notice what is emerging. So to stay present in the now, but also to really acknowledge the reality of where we are now, what is possible from where we are now. You know, in many organizations where, where I work, some of these vision statements, they, you know, it's, it's, they seem very um, inspiring, but when you look at where the organization is today, it's almost impossible for them to move there. So there's a, a bit of a, a split from, from reality. So a key um, principle or a habit here is to stay in the present, to be in the now. And when you look, for example, at how the Polynesian wayfinders, how those navigators work, one of the key things is that they are fully in the present. They have an intention or a, a, des you know, a, a destination a direction in mind, but they're fully in the present looking at, you know, what are the waves doing? What, are, what birds are they seeing? Where are the stars? They are not in that future um, st state. Then this is a quote I love here is that the wayfinder's world is one of becoming, which is very different from that usual um, model that has us going somewhere between two static or fixed things, you know, that A to B mindset, which, which she, um, this is um, Shelly Spiller calls a be going approach. So very, and it's very much around what is emerging in the year and now. Then the second um, principle or habit is to focus on setting direction or intention versus having a specific destination or goal. You know, and, and it's interesting because we're, We've been taught that, you know, we, we need to have smart goals and we need to, you know, we always need to have a goal or a destination in, in mind. And this is true when we're in complicated contexts or when things are ordered and we know exactly, you know, where we need to be, you know, outcomes are known. We know how to get there. We just need to apply our expertise. I'm sure I don't need to you know, explain the difference between complex and complicated to this audience. So we can have goals. And even in complexity, we can have shorter term goals. But if we almost get fixated on a specific destination or a specific end state, that can be quite dangerous in a dynamic, complex environment where things are always changing. Because they hinder our ability to see beyond what we expect to see. And they also provide a false sense of certainty. You know, that's typically based on old assumptions. So this is not to say that we can have no direction. This is saying, you know, we need to broaden it. We need to state an intent. And I think in the military, they talk about commander's intent. And then give a sense of direction. But within that direction, allow for, for pivots or for, for changes. And then lastly, we need to set boundaries or guardrails. It's really interesting, you know, when you look at, at humans, even small children, if you tell them to go and play and it's a very big open space, they will stick quite close to where the adults are, to where their parents are. But if you give them a boundary, if there's some guardrails, they feel freer and they feel more safe to explore. And it's quite the same with adults. So if we don't know where the boundaries are, if we don't know where we're not supposed to go, people very often don't feel safe enough to push the boundaries or to, to explore more broadly. So here, you know, we need to create a container for exploration. You know, it's almost create more of a contained affordance or, or option space. Because otherwise, if it's too broad, then people once again feel overwhelmed and they can become stuck. So those are three principles and habits and they apply to this framework but they also apply more generally 
But so with that, I'm going to jump into the framework itself. So this is called the Ways Finder. I've kind of thought of many different names and this is the one that's stuck. And it's essentially, it's a very simple framework. It's got some, you know, pretty deep theory behind it um, that I'm not going to go into now because I think part of the power of it is in its simplicity. So what it does is it creates a safe container for wayfinding and for exploration. And it, it can be um, applied in mul on multiple different levels. Um, I use it a lot with individuals. Many, many coaches use it as well as they, they coach their, their clients. But then you can also use it in a team. You can use it strategically in an organization and, and even, even beyond. So essentially what we do, and you don't necessarily have to do this in this particular order, but we start with that first principle, which is where are we now? We orient. So where are we today? What is available to us? What are the limits potentially that, that we have? Where are, um, where, where are things changing and where are they staying the same? You know, all of those are the kinds of questions you can ask. Then we set direction or intent. You know, these are constraints that invite. Where are we going and why are we, why do we want to go there? Um, and this is, you know, one of the key um, areas where people tend to struggle is what is the difference between direction and a particular goal? And we're so used to goals that very often we don't set a direction that is broad enough. It essentially just serves the goal of or, or just the same purpose as, as a goal. Or it's so broad that it does not actually provide direction. So I'll give you a few examples as, as we go through. But this is um, you know, one of the, the, the places where we tend to start. Then we look at those boundary conditions. And the first, we need to define or map the, our limits. So these are constraints that inhibit. So where can't we go? And this is, is important because sometimes we look at a particular constraint. So it could be, I don't know, budget or it could be um, a law in a particular country. And we look at that and we say, oh, you know, we can't do anything because this particular constraint is, is in place. Um, in one of my clients, for example, somebody said, you know, we, we have leadership that is so conservative that they don't allow us to do anything. And then they almost just opt out of trying anything. So what we're doing here is we're actually acknowledging what are these constraints? What are the limits? that you feel we can't do anything about, we have to work within them, but then what can we do even though those constraints are there? So it's really important to acknowledge limits. And then on the other side, you'll see the, I'm using a, a dotted line on the other side. We set boundaries and you'll see I use slightly different language here. So on the one hand, we've got limits. On the other hand, we have boundaries. And these are constraints that contain and they enable focus. So these are typically things we choose. Whereas with limits, we normally we can't really do much about it. So this is about, you know, what do we choose not to be? Where do we choose not to go? Because if we don't, if we're not explicit about this, if we're doing this collectively, things can fragment or otherwise it dilutes our focus. So for example, I once worked with a, an executive team in a fertilizer company and their market was you know, disappearing and they needed to find you know, a new direction. And they had to decide, you know, do we want to be a chemical company or do we want to, be, do we want to focus on, on the environment and maybe look at you know, how do we... Um, how do we sustainably um, regenerate environments? We can do that as well. We can't do all of those. So what do we choose not to focus on? So I'm going to give you a personal example or an individual example first, because I find you know this is sometimes easier to, to resonate with. So this is something that I'm personally kind of working towards. So a direction or intent for me is I want to create a life 
with more freedom and joy. I want to, you know, kind of channel my career in that direction. So where am I now? I'm based in South Africa. I've got a global network. I mostly work remotely. I've got a re reputation in a particular space. I've got existing content and I've got skills. So, you know, I, I enjoy writing. So that's part of where I am now. What are some of the limits? Well, I have to earn an income. I can't, you know, do anything that means I won't be able to earn money. I have to pay tax. So I need to be law abiding. And I can't be a botanist or a lawyer. That's just not, you know, it's that's a limit for me in terms of where my skills are. On the other side, I don't want to decode or translate other people's work. I want to do, you know, create my own work. So these are boundaries I'm choosing. I don't want to focus purely on theory and the cognitive aspects of complexity. So I want to explore, you know, the the interplay with um, you know, embodied complexity, or, you know, I, I don't want to only focus on theory. I don't want to sell my time forever. I want to work with clients who wants to work with me. And I want to partner with people I like. So these are boundaries that I'm setting in place for myself. So within this framework, when an opportunity comes, I can now test it against this. So let's say, for example, I am offered a job in somebody else's company. I can say, well, will this move me towards creating a life of more freedom or away from it? Will this enable me to um, not have to sell my time forever? Or is this a consulting engagement where I'm selling time? So it, it becomes something that helps me prioritize and it helps me make choices. And so if I'm feeling a bit stuck in terms of, you know, I don't know exactly what I want to create. At least now I've created a possibility space that is contained within which I can explore. So now if I want to move on from here, I can start saying within this um, framework, or this in this, somebody, some people call it my Sonia's pizza slice. What do I need? What, how do I create enabling conditions? So this could be things like resources. How do I create time and money to free up, you know, um, to free some of my time to create content, for example? Um, how do I have adequate, you know, different diversity of perspectives, people around me who can, you know, give me different perspectives in terms of what I can try? Do I have the right skills and knowledge? Do I have capacity? So do I have the energy? Do I have the attention? Do I have enough slack time or, you know, am I just always busy? So I've just no way that I can experiment. So what do we need to best able, best enable exploration? And, you know, for me, it could be, I need to learn about writing and platforms. I need to learn about video editing. Maybe I need to, um, you know, cultivate relationships with more diverse content partners. I need to set boundaries to create time to do some of these things. And I have to practice self-care. You know, we have an acronym based, which is, you know, um, breathing practices or mindfulness, um, exercise, sleep, and diet. So all of this is creating, enabling conditions within that framework. And then you start experimenting. You know, and this is around taking small steps. You know, here you can have shorter term goals but this is about learning. It's about experimenting. You know, Dave Snowden talks about portfolios of safe to fail experiments. And it's about taking small steps and maintaining momentum, not getting it right or staying safe. So multiple diverse experiments, focusing possibly on adjacent possibilities. So where are the so-called low hanging fruit? Where are things already emerging? And then enabling connections and collaborations, you know, Waste finding is not a solitary in endeavor, especially, you know, if you're, um, well, if, if you're an individual, but also in a large organization. So here, you know, I'm experimenting with things like buy me a coffee. Um, I'm, we're creating online learning platforms. Um, 
experimenting with collaborative re retreats where I'm collaborating with artists. So these are all things that I'm experimenting with to see, you know, which of which of these have the potential to, you know, generate this freer life. And then the connections I'm creating here is with artists, content experts in, in adjacent fields. And then finally, I need to create feedback flows because wayfinding, you know, can't you you can't do wayfinding without feedback. If the whole idea is to explore uncharted territory, if it's about moving into um, you know, into the unknown, I need feedback to understand if I'm moving in the right direction, if what I'm doing is working, if I need to shift, if I need to change. So here you pay attention to your individual reflective capability, mindfulness, noticing progress and learning. So not only measuring outcomes, feedback from the environment or the context, and then feedback from diverse others. You know, this is why you want to surround yourself with, you know, diverse perspectives. And so that is the, the essence of, of the Wayfinder framework. It's, as I said, it's, it's very simple. Many people only kind of create the cone. They only, you know, kind of look at what is the direction or intent? Where are my limits? Where am I today? What do I have to work with? And what boundaries do I choose to put in place so that I don't dilute my focus or so that I don't um, kind of move too far away from my values? You don't have to go through, through all the others. But I thought maybe before I end, I wanted to just show you um, a little bit what this could look like. So this is a summary slide. It's very busy. So apologies for that. But I just wanted to show you what this could look like when you apply this um, in a collective. And so this could be in a team or it could be a team of teams or even in an organization. And here, the key kind of benefit of this is it enables autonomy without losing coherence. So people don't all have to do exactly the same thing. They can be exploring in different areas, but they don't fragment. So I chose, I decided, you know, this is about systemic agility. I don't know a lot about systemic agility, so all of this may be wrong, but this is a stab and maybe a conversation starter. So let's say our direction is to cultivate systemic agility. Now that is quite broad. You can't really say it's a goal, but it is a direction that we want to move into. Might be a bit too broad, you might want to narrow it, but this is the direction we want to move into. So where are we today? So, you know, things that we can think about is, you know, how are we working now? Are we, is it, are we working in a hybrid way? Are we remote? Are we in person? Where, how is the geographic dis dis distribution? What are our current skills? What is our culture and what is our orientation towards change? You know, is this a heavily change fatigued organization, for example? What industry are we in? Um, are we coming off of many failed agile implementations, which, you know, in, in my client base, that is quite, quite common. Um, where can't we go? Well, there are laws, re 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 regulatory compliance. If it's a team, you know, you're operating in a corporate context, so there might be certain policies and procedures you need to adhere to. We may lack specific skills and there's no easy way to, to get them. And we can't afford for productivity to suffer. So those might be limits that we simply have to work within. Where do we choose not to go? So what are the boundaries that, we, that we're choosing? So here we can say, well, we want to be true to agile principles. We may not be you know, installing any of the agile methods, but we want to stay true to the principles. Or we could say, we want whatever this process looks like, it needs to be emergent, sustainable, bottom up. Or we want to keep people healthy and, and engaged. We don't want to compromise on people's well-being. You know, these are the kinds of things that you would that you would um, con consider there. What resources do we need? Diversity. I think you know, adequate diversity is always critical in complexity. We need slack and learning time. You know, so if we are going to ask people to adopt new ways of work, then we need to make sure that they've got time to learn. 
We need potentially new spaces, new tools, if we want to visualize things, for, for example. And we may need different policies and processes. How do we remain coherent? You know, so this is where there's a slight shift when you're doing this collectively. How do we make sure that we don't fragment? How do we make sure that we learn from each other? So if all of these, you know, different um, teams are exploring different ways of, of potentially becoming agile, how do we make sure that there's learning that happens? You know, so here what we can do is shared review um, cadences, um, joint upstream prioritization so that we make sure that, you know, everybody has shared pro you know, priorities, a shared understanding of strat strategy. These are some of the things we can think about there. And then, you know, within this, we experiment. So we allow different teams to experiment with their own fit for context ways of being agile, however they, they interpret that. Because as long as they stay within the same limits and they are within the same boundaries, so they are staying true to the agile principles, it's emergent, sustainable, bottom-up, et cetera, we know that it will be coherent even though we don't all look exactly the same. We can experiment with things like different approaches to performance management. We can experiment with different ways of budgeting, you know, like beyond budgeting. All of these things can happen at the same time, but because it's within those boundaries and heading in the same direction, we can be fairly sure that it will remain coherent. And then again, we need feedback. So which of these approaches are potentially providing positive metrics? You know, so if we're looking at things like flow metrics, where are we seeing success? What is creating energy and discretionary effort in, in people? And what results in more delighted customers? You know, these are some of the things that we can look at from a feedback perspective. So I realize I've thrown quite a lot at you. Um, you know, this is, it's a simple framework, but there's, you know, quite a lot behind it. So maybe before I end, um, if you want to find out more, um, I am uh, running a, a full day workshop on this with my friends at CRISP in Sweden. And for anybody from this community, we're very happy to offer a 20% discount if you'd like to, to book for this. And I think that is it. I think this is my final slide. You'll see my buy me a coffee experiment there that I'm that I'm running. And with that, Brian, I think I am going to stop sharing and see what questions or conversations came up. Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Um, yes, there's one question so far in the in the chat and uh, the rest of you feel free to put questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand and um, just speak them out. Um, so Leonardo is asking um, your example Using it to check on an opportunity is clear, but how about an empty space or a strategic planning session? How do you apply it then? Can you say a little bit more what you mean by an empty space? I'm not quite sure I understand exactly what you mean. Yeah, Le Leonardo, do, do you want to unmute yourself and ask or clarify a bit more in the chat? Are you still there? I don't actually see Leonardo anymore. So he may have dropped off. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll, hmm. I'll I'll answer as I as I think I understand it. You know, I I think the um, you don't necessarily only always use it when an opportunity is clear. You know, it's it's almost it's more when you know that you need to head into a particular direction, but you don't really you don't fully know what it is that you need to to move there so you're almost it's an exploratory um space that that you're in so you know where you can't go you know the direction you want to go into but you don't necessarily know how to get there so as you start moving the opportunities will also present themselves so sometimes if you're really in uncharted territory and you have no idea what you're dealing with you will just start running experiments to see, you know, what is out there, almost for the the opportunities to show themselves, or even even the risks to show themselves. Um, so it's it's very much interacting with it. You know, I think it's Donella Meadows that says 
you dance with a complex system. And so if this is uncharted or you're, you know, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty, you're going to run experiments almost for, you know, to, to, for the opportunities and the risks to start showing themselves. You're not necessarily exploring a particular opportunity um, when you're um, using this framework. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, uh, that's to me. Leonardo, if you, if you want to clarify anything, please feel free. Uh, any other questions, comments from anyone? Uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll, I'll, ah, there we have Maru. Maru, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, Maru. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Daniel. It was, uh, uh, resonated very much with me. Um, I wonder if you've, you've probably tried to apply this to various areas. And I wonder if you've used this in the field of strategy work, um, in particular, um, entrepreneurial or emerging type of strategy. There's 10, 10 schools of thinking around strategy. They're quite different. But one of them I feel is very close to what you're doing, which is very popular in the entrepreneurship circles. So I'd mm -hmm. love to know anything, any thinking you have on, on the topic of strategy with ways funding. Yes, that's that's one of the the areas where it's been used quite quite a bit, you know. And the the nice thing with this is it can sit quite nicely next to other approaches or other, you know, even st strategic frameworks. So when I have used it with um, with strategy, very often where it really is useful is to make sure that everybody really has a shared understanding of what the strategy is and where the different parts of the organization or the you know the different where the different aspects fit in so what we what we very often do with strategy is we'd have one overarching framework that sets the str strategic direction and also you know sets the the boundaries because this becomes very important if you want to you know allow for um autonomy in different parts of the organization but for there not to be fragmentation. So there needs to be a shared understanding of what these are. But then within that broader framework, there are, you know, each of the various business units, for example, can have their own ways finder with their own direction and their own boundaries, but it sits within the broader framework. So this is very often used, particularly when, um, as you say, in on when it's on entrepreneurial, it's exploratory, or in organizations where they need to actually go through a bit of a transformation. You know, they they need to shift markets or they need to um, find new revenue streams. So where they really feel that need for exploration, um, that's where it really comes into its own. And you can have other strategic frameworks almost fit within it. Um, so I don't think it's a competing framework. Um, I hope that that makes that answers your question or it makes sense. Richard. Hi, Sonia. Um, I really love this. It's I, for me, it, it sort of resonates really, really strongly um, with I mean, I'm, I'm on a late in life sort of journey to sort of try and work out um, you know, I want I want to do something around complexity, and for me, this you know, it, 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 it's a, it, it, I mean, it, I can see all the underlying sort of theory behind it, but it it makes it I think more palatable, or more understandable I think for people who haven't been immersed in say the work of Dave Snowden or whatever, and I mean, my question really is, um. I mean, you touched on this at the beginning about the fact that um, I mean, many organisations and many people um, you really find it difficult to live with uncertainty and live with messy problems. You know, and the and the beauty of five year strategies is they give you this spurious certainty. You know, we have a plan. Um, you know, the fact it's never going to work out is is actually. I mean, this. A book called um, Poles Apart. I don't know if you've come across it. It's about um, you know the fact we live in such a divided society, and I don't know. 
Uh, it's 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 well researched, and I mean, there's been research done that show that a significant proportion of the population actually prefer um, un, you know, certainty that's wrong mm. over yeah uncertainty. And it, I mean, when you're sort of talking to potential clients, I mean, I I now I now have nicked a, a quote from. Um, from Tom Gill, from Tom, um, who has been a massive influence on my thinking from since when I read his book in 1986, 1987, which is that um, if I'm uncertain, I'll say so with no uncertainty. Um, and I use that to um, sort of try and work out, you know, I say, look, you know, if you can't with clients or potential clients, if you can't cope with that, then I think you know we're better off heading off in different directions. Um, and so I mean, what I'm sort of heading towards is, I mean, there are some people who get this and there are some people for whom it just creates anxiety. And in your experience, are you better? Have you converted anybody, I suppose? Or are you better just walking away from ones that are um looking very worried or very anxious or for whom saying yeah well, where's the yeah where's the plan um um so i'll stop talking but no i mean it, it was well, sort of no I, I i hear you richard and i i think my experience is i don't really have to convince people anymore that they can't opt out of uncertainty and you know it's 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 almost you know it's it's our lived reality. I think it's why acronyms like VUCA and Barney and all of these you know it's becoming so pop popular because it describes what people are experiencing. I think sometimes the mistake we make as as complexity practitioners, and this is and I'm 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 speaking about myself here. Sometimes we lead with the theory, so. When we, when we sit in front of a client, um, either we try and scare them or we lead with the theory. We almost try and convince them how cool complexity is. And I think when you are in a space where you know that what's always worked for you is no longer working, if you're in a leadership role, you know, people expect you to know things and you can no longer, you can't know anymore, you know, so there is that underlying anxiety. I think to meet people where they are and to give them practical tools that almost acknowledges, we know that this is difficult, you know, and it's one of the reasons why I created this framework because it's simple. It acknowledges that people need to, you know, we need to acknowledge their limits and we need to allow them to set boundaries. You know, so sometimes they end up with a, uh, a, a framework that's only this, it's only, it's only opened this much. But for them, it's already, it feels quite scary. But once they start moving, they start, you know, re relaxing a little bit. So I think it's about meeting them where they are with things that kind of acknowledges that it's difficult, that's practical. And if they want to understand the theory, you know, you can always kind of, you know, teach it to them afterwards. But the mistake I always used to make was almost to lead with that. And then if you're going with all the jargon and all of the, it just adds to the overwhelm. It doesn't really help them to get unstuck. I don't know if that if that helps at all, but I find that nowadays I don't need to convince people anymore. Um, they, they know. So, Tom, I think you were next. Yeah. So uh, I have a theory that what people call complex is something they don't understand because they don't have the tools to understand it. They're staring at the heavens and they have no telescope, put it that way. So, uh, and a simple example of that is if you don't know how to quantify the various qualities like security and usability of a system, then understanding that system will be very difficult. If you do know how to quantify those things, then it's more understandable. So, uh, and I've put in the chat a free copy of my Technoscopes book. So anybody can have 100 little tools, Technoscopes, right? Like telescopes, so that the complex systems don't seem so complex anymore. What do you no, think? Thanks, Tom. I, well, I think 
as something that can be understood if you've got the right tools and the right um scopes almost you know if if you're if you can quantify it's probably something that was in my language would be hyper complicated because you can figure it out if you've got the right tools and the right you know as you said if you can quantify the right things i think something that is truly complex um you know and and i like to go to the root word yeah that's entangled and it's continuously changing and dynamic so the moment you actually try and quantify it it's already changed i don't know that you know it's so i think there are some things that's truly complex and to try and quantify or reduce them you know it it's it it's never really going to work but i do think and this is what i what i think tom is very often when people talk about we need to simplify the complexity what they're really talking about is we need to simplify the overcomplicatedness that we've created almost in response to complexity so i think there's definitely an an aspect to to that you know that and and language is also not helping because we almost use complex and complicated inter, interchangeably and very often we call these hyper complicated things complex and so not everything is complex i think that is um so yes, I, I, there is truth to that, and then I disagree slightly, if that makes. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Faye. I think you were next. Hi, thanks, Sonia. Um, yeah, I love I love your model actually, and as somebody who's definitely fallen down that hole of trying to explain complexity within organisations. Um, from a theoretical point, point of view to start with and then getting blank faces, then I, I can see how your model is really helpful. And I love the way you said, um, do experiments for the opportunities and risks to show themselves. I thought that was a great way of putting it. Um, but I had a little question going on there. And I was thinking about how, you know, the direction of travel sounds, so we're talking about the future of the world, that it's going to get more and more unknown and unpredictable potentially. And the direction of travel suggests that we know which way to go <laughs> and, and that we're basing that off of um, a set of assumptions that are, you know, have us in this place that we find ourselves now. And so I started thinking about, so what happens if you don't really know the direction of travel to go in? Is it that you just have to broaden out to your direction of travel until you get broad enough to then have like the direction of travel might come in, you know, in those little pizza mm. slots? within or yeah I was just wondering about that because I was thinking there's an element there that just feels very concrete and I think there might be so much um, facing us that is not concrete and I was interested in how you approach that. I, I think if you're in a space where you've got no idea it's almost just choosing one direction and to start moving and if it's not working adjusting. Mm. I think mostly we have an idea of yeah. the direction where we, and I, I, I like to use an, an analogy here. It's the difference between planning a business trip. So I want to go to Cape Town to meet with certain clients or to go to a conference. I know exactly where I'm going, you know, so I book my ticket, mm. I can book my hotel, I can tell people exactly when I'll get there. So there is a a rigidity, a specificity to that, that assumes predictability versus I know I want to head towards in South Africa, you know, I want to head towards the Western Cape. So I want to end up somewhere near the ocean. I'm not entirely sure where, but I don't want to go to KwaZulu Natal. So I know I'm heading in that direction. And then I start moving. And I might, you know, along the way, I might end up, you know, either closer to the West Coast or closer to the South Coast or whatever the case might be. But I'm I'm not directionless mm. because they end up just drifting. Yeah. So I think it's and, and this is a bit of a of, of an art is to have that direction narrow enough. You know, so when I go back to my example, I want a life that, you know, that is that has more freedom and more joy. It's quite broad, but I can use it to measure things against. So mm -hmm. if I'm given a job opportunity, I can say, well, will this give me more freedom or not? Will this give me joy or not? Maybe I don't really know. So I can try it. And then I realize mm, this isn't giving me joy. So if it's too broad, 
Like, yeah. I just want an emotional life. It, it yeah. doesn't. And if it's too narrow, like I want a new job in a bank, then yeah. it's not. So there's a bit of a, a, a an art to getting the broadness right. Um, I can see that. Yeah, that's really yeah. helpful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, I see there are two more yeah. hands up. I don't know how. how yeah, you are. I, think, I think we're we're just on time, so maybe uh, apologies to Raj and uh, Rick. I think we'll we'll end there. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Sonia. And uh, yeah, it it seems like there's a lot of interest in this topic, as you can tell from all the questions. Um, and very beautifully uh, put. Uh, I, I'd I'd like to copy paste your talk, uh, uh, especially the first part is, uh, is really some of those quotes um, really spoke to the heart, uh, the felt sense of uh, uncertainty and complexity, um, and then and then turning it into a very practical um, tool set as well. So yeah, thank, thanks for sharing your time with us.